Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with E.J. Dion Miles Rapp, and Rapp, Miles Rappaport presenting their new book, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. Their conversation tonight will be moderated by Maria Teresa Kumar. Uh, through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our ever-growing digital community during these challenging times. Um, thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Um, our events calendar for the spring is filling up with both virtual and a very exciting development uh, in-person events again. Um, the calendar appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. After the introduction, I will drop a link in the chat uh, to order 100% Democracy. Your purchases make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Uh, this evening's event will include time for your questions. Uh, if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event also has closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption live transcript button on your screen. And finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings over the past two years, um, technical issues might arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly and we thank you for your patience and understanding. E.J. Dion is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and a professor at Georgetown and a visiting professor at Harvard. His column in the Washington Post is syndicated nationally and you may be familiar with him from appearances on NPR, MSNBC and PBS. He's the author of numerous books, including 2020's Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save Our Country. Miles Rappaport is a senior practice fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center, and he served as the president of Common Cause, a grassroots organization dedicated to making sure elections are fair, open, and accessible, and as the president of Demos, a public policy center, and as Connecticut Secretary of State. Today, their conversation will be led by Maria Teresa Kumar, an activist, social entrepreneur, and Emmy-nominated MSNBC contributor and host. Uh, she's the founding president of Voto Latino, and serves on the board of EMILY's List and is a member of the Fat Council on Foreign Relations and the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers. For those of us keeping an eye on voting restrictions like SB1 in Texas, um, it feels like we're in a moment when act, in which access to voting is being made more onerous and more restrictive and that the idea of increased voter turnout feels like a pipe dream. But in their new book, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting, EJ and Miles argue that asking, even requiring every American citizen to vote is the surest way to protect against voter suppression and the active, and active dis disenfranchisement and to ensure the future of our democracy. Interview in the Washington Post, Didi Quo writes, this call for universal voting is undergirded by optimism, urgency, and a bit of, bit of naivete, the sort welcome in a genre that is otherwise bleak. 100% Democracy argues that we are in a time of democratic renewal based on the surge in voting in 2020. Dion and Rappaport want us to think big, to envision a world where voting is easy and routine. They imagine a future built on civic participation and pride rather than one built on democratic subversion. Theirs is a compelling case for a radical idea, one that might even have deep skeptics shrugging and asking, why not? And Publishers Weekly says that backed by copious data and a firm grasp of the legislative process, this is a cogent call for rethinking the electoral process. And so now I am thrilled to turn things over to tonight's speakers. Uh, the digital podium is yours, uh, Maria Teresa, uh, EJ and Miles. Claire, thank you for that incredible introduction, but I have to say, I would be remiss if I did not underscore what was missed from my bio. I am a proud Harvard Kennedy School grad, so it's <laughs> wonderful to be in community with all of you. I am here with two of my very favorite people because we have conversations like this. Thank you for those who are joining us. There is not a more important moment than to have the conversation about a 100% democracy, the case for universal voting. I'm so happy to have such a great turnout, and thank you to the Harvard Bookstore and Claire for such really an impeccable introduction of all of us here. I'm overjoyed to be here tonight, not because 
voter participation is such a critical topic for our democracy because I have to get, I get to get into a conversation with two of the smartest, sharpest observers of our, of our political system today, EJ Dion and Miles Rappaport. And I don't say that lightly. I say our political system and not just politics, because I think EJ and Miles have both have a real gift for seeing way beyond the horizon and of the day to day, but really looking around the corner. What is happening? What are we talking about when it comes to political gamemanship in Washington? And what can we really do to make things happen? How do we shake it up? I think we could all agree that the last couple of years have shown the fragility of our democracy when we are not participating. But in this conversation tonight, we're going to be able to demonstrate that not only are Americans participating, we're participating in record numbers. And as a result, a few folks are spooked by it. And what can universal voting do to ensure that we all are living up to our four founders possibility of what America really is, and that is equal participation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the conversation. I want to say that I have enjoyed getting to know EJ and Miles over the years because I'm part of the Universal Voting Task Force that they put together in partnership with Harvard's Ash Center and Brookings Institute. And I have to tell you, the varied conversations we had because around that table, it wasn't just Democrats or Republicans, but we had independents, we had libertarians all coming together, recognizing that the sanctity of the voting booth is what really powers our democracy. And so with that, let me just go ahead and dive in. And first of all, yeah, EJ and Miles, let me ask you the first question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind. Where are you piping in from? Um, so I'm in Bethesda, Maryland uh, at home. And, Miles? and I'm in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, also at home. So, but I'm glad to be with both of you for sure. Wonderful. And so I will tell you full disclosure, I am live from Washington, DC. I always like to say that because it reminds me of, I'd love to be able to say that someday on SNL. So live from Washington, DC. <laughs> it doesn't have the same ring to it for whatever reason, but I want to talk to you seriously, EJ, about the issue of the book. Why now? Well, first of all, thank you. First of all, thank you to Claire. That was a delightful introduction to all of us. Thank you to the Harvard Bookstore, one of my very favorite bookstores in the world, where I've spent many hours browsing those shelves. Uh, and to Maria Teresa, if I didn't know she had about 5,600 different commitments after that incredibly kind introduction, I'd say, Maria Teresa, come to every event we do for the next uh, couple of months. That was so kind of you, and it would be great to hang out with you anyway, and Maria Teresa has done so much to foster political uh, participation in our country. Um, why do we write this book? Uh, we wrote this book because uh, growing out of the work of a, the working group uh, we established, uh, spearheaded by Miles, uh, to find a kind of game-changing idea that might get us out of the morass of the voting wars. Um, and there are two broad reasons why we, we think that the United States should adopt a system similar to the one that's been in operation in Australia for a hundred years. So there's real proof of concept here. Right. Um, and in two dozen uh, other countries uh, around the world. Um, the first is we don't think elections should be like exclusive dinner parties. Think about how campaigns work right, work right now. There is an A list of likely voters, and then there are B and C lists of voters whom the political consultants say they probably won't vote, so it's not really worth your time to communicate with them. So we spend all our time, uh, our candidates spend almost all their time to begin with, communicating largely with a fixed uh, group of voters. That has a number of effects on our campaigns. One is um, that you spend all your time trying to uh, uh, engage your base. And as uh, Term Miles has taught me, you enrage to engage. Uh, and that has certain effects on our politics. But you also spend a lot of time trying to disengage your opponents. Um, we, I, I'm going to get to overt efforts to suppress the vote. But a lot of campaigns are directed toward making sure turnout is low on the other side, um, which takes a politics, which is already a really tough business uh, and makes it even more negative. It creates more incentives for attack 
and fewer incentives uh, for including everybody. Um, I've started to think that the slogan of our book, for those of you who like detective fiction, um, Michael Connolly's Harry Bosch likes to say, everybody counts or nobody counts. And that's the theory of our book. But the second reason why we see it as urgent is because of the rise of voter suppression uh, all over, in many parts of our country, depending on how you count up to 19 states. And that's a real shame because when we look back at the, 2000, at the 2020 election, we ought to be very proud of ourselves. We had an election in the middle of a pandemic. All over the country, in red states as well as blue states, election officials, and in some cases, state legislatures, change the law to make it easier to vote. Um, I like to uh, note that I was very proud to vote in a drop box with my mail ballot in front of Walt Whitman High School. I like that for two reasons. One, it's where my kids, our kids went to high school. And two, Walt Whitman is the poet of democracy. So I thought, what an appropriate thing as I dropped my ballot. Those drop boxes made an enormous difference uh, in many parts of the country. So we got a turnout of uh, roughly two thirds of Americans, which was the highest turnout in a hundred years, in many ways, the highest turnout ever, yeah. uh, because it was a, you know, in an electorate that included it, it, everybody. I want to drill down on that, because I think one of the things that folks, you know, we hear about these this voter suppression, and it really doesn't materialize unless you're a young person, or otherwise, you're all of a sudden, you find yourself uh, purged out of the voting rolls. We Texas just experienced, for example, uh, their primary election, where, where Texas is already considered the hardest to vote state. Uh, miles. And they decided in the last year and a half to implement even more arduous uh, uh, voting restrictions that in fact, it turned out that roughly 30% of the ballots that were turned in for their primary election were thrown out. And many of these individuals they found were, uh, it was a 70, the average age was a 77 year old Latina woman who had voted in 2016, 2018 and 2020. Yet because of this Dropbox issue or because of the ballot invalidation, she was thrown out. And, I, and Miles, I wanna highlight something that you said in your book, you know, research by the Brennan Center for Justice found that between 2014, which is right after the Voting Guts Rights Act was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2016, almost 16 million voters were removed from the voter registration list, a 33% increase in the number removed between 2006 and 2008, between the same, basically the same time period. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you were the former Secretary of State for Connecticut. Can you right. talk about that impl implication and why every American, regardless of Republican, Independent, Democratic, or Libertarian, should be alarmed by this? Sure. Uh, but first, I want to say thank you to you, Maria Teresa, for having and uh, having us, so to speak, and, and being part of this conversation. And also a major thanks to EJ. Uh, he and I worked really, really closely together on the working group. Uh, we issued a report in 2020. And then this book was a kind of easy labor of love for both of us. So uh, could I just say my thanks back to Miles? I've been saying at every group that Miles Rappaport has so much energy that if Europe could tap Miles' energy, they would not need another drop of Russian oil or gas. So <laughs> it's been a real joy to work with somebody like that. <laughs> In any event, uh, I think, Maria Teresa, that you're putting your finger on something really, really important, which is that, um, you know, it, this has been around for a while, the attempts to kind of prevent people from voting or, you know, kind of depress the vote. But after the 2020 elections, it's really gone into overdrive in, a num in many, many states, Texas among them, Georgia among them. And one of the ways that people are prevented from voting is by excessive purging. And I should say as Secretary of the State that proper list maintenance and making sure that dead people don't stay on the rolls and people who have moved out of state are, kicked, are not on the rolls, that's a proper election function. But what has happened is that the aggressiveness of purging like Georgia has an exact match law, which basically says that if you're if there's even a decimal point or a, or a middle initial or a married name versus maiden name uh, out of place, your vote doesn't count. And so, yes, uh, lots and lots of people were taken off the rolls. It's also worth saying, though, that that at the same time that all these states have been trying to push the the voting rolls back, a number of states have made real progress. 
and are taking what happened in 2020, as EJ mentioned, you know, all of the ways in which the, the vote adjusted to the pandemic and have moved things forward. So we had this kind of crazy dichotomy between people who are trying to expand the vote, people who are trying to contract the vote. And what we hope to do with 100% with, uh, democracy is to kind of leap over all of that and just make the fundamental democratic assertion that every single person should participate. And I think that we have proof of concept in Australia, but I think it would be a huge benefit for the United States as well. And so I want, one of the topics that you, you uh, broach in it is this idea of universal voting sometimes scares people. They think that it is punitive, that you're basically not exercising your right to free speech or not. No, or, or not. Uh, and the other concern was that there would be a whole bunch of ignorant voters. I'll right. tell you, my job is to register as many voters all the time, and the public has a very good idea of who's telling the truth or not instinctually. And so I take, you know, I, I take exception to that. But but talk about those two issues that pe that really are, seem to be resounding. This idea that you are infringing on someone's uh, free speech constitutional right by imposing universal voting, because I think that you guys debunk it really well in the book. Miles, I'll start with you, and then uh, EJ. And before you guys go get started, please, if the audience please has any questions, please do pepper us with them. Okay. Well, on the question of kind of, uh, this is an, an excessively compulsory system. Um, for me, the analogy to jury duty is really, really important. Um, I've grown up uh, all my life at that when you are called to serve on a jury, you're required to serve. It is a required civic duty. And the reason for that is that we want juries to be genuinely representative of the population as a whole, a jury of your peers. Um, I think the exact same logic applies to voting, which is we should want, we do want, we do want, and everyone should want that the decisions that are made about government and about those people who are gonna be in government should be made by a fully inclusive, fully representative sample of the, of the people of, of the country. And that's not the case now. Uh, so we think that uh, having a requirement to vote which we have in many, many other walks of life, um, would also be a fundamentally fairer way to have an election. And we are very careful in the proposal, as you know, Maria Teresa, from participating in many of those conversations, um, that we are not doing this to punish people. We are doing this to create a culture of voting uh, that uh, everyone feels a part of. And that's clearly what they've created in Australia, where with a very efficient registration system, 96% of the population is registered. You have a duty to register, but the government registers most people and 91% of them participate. We have very light touch enforcement. Um, we, the way we would do it is roughly the way they do it in Australia is more or less the way they do it in Australia. If you don't vote, uh, you get uh, a little a, a no notification in the mail saying you didn't vote. Um, their fine is about 15 bucks, is 20 Australian dollars. It's about 15 bucks on the current exchange rate. We don't want a fine bigger than 20 bucks. It's not a criminal fine. We don't want to have a Ferguson problem. So it's not compounded. There's no interest. You can pay it with an hour community service. But when you send back your form, if you give any reasonable excuse for why you didn't show up, you don't pay the fine. In Australia, in the end, only about 13% of non-voters ever actually have to pay the fine. So this is not a big brother deal here. But just to make sure, we also propose in a great American tradition that you can file for conscientious objector status. If you have some deep objection to participating in the political process, uh, you can declare that. Um, uh, the other thing, um, the other thing, what the other thing we do is you don't have to vote for anybody. Um, we don't think the government tells you you have a right to make a choice between Miles Rappaport and Maria Teresa Kumar. Boy, that would be a hard choice for me. Um, if you don't like either of those, even if I can't imagine that, uh, you don't have to vote for anybody. Um, you can cast a blank ballot, you can scroll whatever you want on the ballot. And then just to make triple sure, we would add a none of the above option. So no one has, this is not compelled speech. You only have to participate uh, in the election. And we think that's the best way to defend voting rights because mm -hmm. then the whole system is geared to make it as easy as possible for everybody to do their duty. 
And what you in the book, you basically also explain that basically onus all of a sudden comes comes for parties to actually compete for those votes and to ensure that the system works. And I also thought one of the things that was super fun that Voto Latino has implemented a long time ago was basically party at the polls. This idea that it is a celebratory event that we're celebrating democracy in our community. But I do want to ask, and this is, you know, this is from Neil Pepper and the in the audience asking, how far does compulsory voting actually uh, actually go? How is it a recent idea? How how far in the past does it go, uh, Miles? Well, uh, uh, it's it's interesting. There here uh, for those people who are ne any anywhere near the Harvard bookstore and physically, uh, Massachusetts has actually a an amendment to the Massachusetts Constitution, which says that the legislature may enact compulsory voting as long as it is secret. Uh, so that's about a, that's about 120 years back. Uh, but the real uh, uh, example that we use most forcefully is the example of Australia, which enacted this in 1924. Actually, some of the uh, states within Australia enacted it before that. Immediately upon its enactment, uh, the turnout for the election went from 60% beforehand to 90% afterwards. And has it has stayed there pretty much all the way through election after election. In 2019, 96.3% of Australians were actually registered to vote. And of those 91.9% actually voted in the parliamentary elections of 2019. So that's a really astounding figure. I mean, we, as EJ said, we were celebrating at the end of 2018 and 2020 2018 was the highest midtown midterm turnout at 50%, and 2020 the highest presidential turnout at 66.2. Well, that's really not something to write home about. So I think this is a, a real opportunity. And as EJ said, the proof of concept for 100 years in Australia, people really like the system. They don't view it as, a, as burdensome. Um, they just take it as a matter of course, and they do have the party at the polls. You're ahead of your time, Maria Teresa, <laughs> but they do that in Australia. They have democracy sausages. Mm -hmm. yeah, we need a vegan uh, alternative, of course. But we explicitly proposed that in the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was very impressed because you're very much attuned to the times. So By, by the way, I, Maria Teresa, your party at the polls uh, uh, idea, uh, the book shows there's actually academic research on this. And it shows that parties and celebrations actually increase voter turnout. So you are really on to something. Well, and I, I hear that food, basically, if you're in the dorm room, food will get you out of your dorm room. So it's, it's a topic, I have to tell you, I, you know, one of the things that I, I do want to address is this whole idea of people going back and saying, but there are ignorant voters out there. Uh, one of the things that uh, was very much uh, by I said by the founder of the Heritage Foundation was that he didn't want everybody voting because ignorant voters would actually uh, change the politics that he espoused. Can you speak a little bit about this this I would say misunderstanding of what what we're trying to get at when we're talking about a perfect functioning democracy, uh, EJ? You know, we really take the so-called ignorant voters argument on really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, first, one of the things you notice is people who really hate our idea really don't like the current electorate either. Uh, and they tend to say that, you know, these folks don't make intelligent choices. They're not intelligent. If you believe in democracy, you believe in the fundamental decency and common sense of every single potential voter. And that's what we do. There are two great books on this in political science. One is V.O. Key's The Responsible Electorate, and the other is Sam Popkin's book, The Reasoning Voter. And I love the first sentence of V.O. Key's book is uh, the fundamental and controversial idea of this little book is that voters are not fools. <laughs> uh, and that's what we believe. But more than that, we go back uh, to go over to Australia again. Kim Beasley um, who was actually the Australian ambassador to the U.S., was the leader of the Labor Party over there, spent his whole life at polling places because his dad was in politics. So from the time he was a little boy, he's been giving out palm, cup, palm cards and political information at the polls. And he made the point that you can tell the people who are real political junkies and would have voted have come hell or high water, and people who may actually be brought into the system because they are required to, but as he said, those voters also take their responsibility very seriously. And he always had the sense that they were casting a ballot based on deliberation. 
Um, and again, this system makes sure that all those voters get the voter information, not only the formal um, uh, uh, for, uh, stuff sent up by the government, but all of the arguments from the political campaigns. We don't make any effort uh, or much effort to mobilize low propensity voters. Mm -hmm. This system, by bringing them to the polls, will get them an enormous amount of information. And we, just so you know, go ahead, Miles. I was just gonna say, we in that case does not include you, Marie Theresa. You're a, the master of, uh, of bringing out new voters and we love you for it. Um, but I would say, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll just tell a personal story actually, because I was uh, in politics and I ran in 11 campaigns. And when I would go, I loved to go out door knocking. It just was one of the most inspiring things uh, in the campaigns. But when I went out, they, my campaign managers would give me a list with two, di with two differentiations, one people who were actually registered and then the second one was who were prime voters, we called them back then. Uh, and they would basically tell me, when you're walking down the street, if you see someone who is not on the list, do not stop and talk to them because they can't help you. And so it's a waste of your time and the candidate's time is the most precious campaign asset, et cetera, et cetera. So I would literally walk down streets and if there were three or four people sitting on a stoop, but they weren't on the list, I would just walk by them and I felt terrible doing it. And uh, it's, you know, and one of the wonderful things about this is that every single person you know out there is a voter, will be voting, and you have to make sure that all of them believe, you know, hear your message and, uh, and understand your views rather than just ignoring them and just trying to turn out more of your base than the other person's. By the way, Maria Torres, every time Miles tells this story and you know Miles too, I, I think that's the only thing he says in our meetings that I don't believe, because I can't believe Miles would walk by anybody. So my vision is that his campaign aides are there tugging him. Dragging him, dragging him. But this is, but, but Miles, you touched on something that's so important. What people don't understand oftentimes is that low propensity voters include working people, and they also disproportionately include young people. Yeah. So the way it works for folks that are listening, it basically means that if you don't have a history of at least voting at least five times, campaigns won't talk to you. By default, the largest generation of eligible voters are under the age of 29. By default, even if you've only voted once, you're not on anybody's radar. At Voter Latino, we registered last, last year 650,000 folks. 55% of them were first-time voters and 83% of them cast a vote and they cast it early. But that's because we were growing the electoral base and we intentionally identified 3.7 million people that were low propensity voters because we knew that Miles didn't have the bandwidth or the, you know, or the opportunity, oftentimes the time nor the funding to go after you and we do. But what you're proposing with universal voting is that every voter would be talked to. And that is actually helps get money out of politics. And yes. we can have another further discussion on how that's a great thing for everyone. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, in countries where universal voting is in place, is there any correlation to the increase or decrease of people who run for office? That's a great question. You know, I don't think I have a clue as to the answer to that question. I'm going to look it up now, but I don't, I haven't seen, the only person I can think of, Miles, who might have the answer to that is Shane Singh, our colleague, uh, who is probably the academic in the U.S. who's done the most work in this area. Um, so I don't know what the answer, do you know, Miles, the answer to that question? I don't know question. the answer to that specifically, but it's certainly, what it does do is bring people into the process who have never been in before. Mm -hmm. And so that is the beginning of what I hope will be a kind of an upward cycle. We have a vicious cycle now where people don't participate, people get more cynical, the government is less responsive, it's more responsive to the high donors than it is to the you know, low propensity voters. Um, and what I hope we can do with this is start a virtuous cycle where once everybody is part of the electorate, the system, as a whole and the institutions of our country will bend themselves towards the idea of full participation. So I like to tell this story. If I'm, a, if I'm a high school principal and I know that every graduating senior has a requirement to go out and vote, is that does that make me more likely to do a better job of civic education for those students? I think it really does. Mm -hmm. And even if I'm an employer and I know that every one of my employees is gonna have to go and vote, 
Does it make it more likely that I will give them the time off to do that and to participate? I think it does. So I think what you'll see hopefully is that the institutions will bend themselves toward it and the, the campaigns will be different because the campaigns will, A, they won't, as you just said, Maria, Teresa, they won't have to spend all this money turning out their vote because the voters will be there. Um, but what, what they will do is have to persuade the entire electorate that the ideas are good. And I think that will be a really, really healthy thing to happen. I think you definitely, both of you basically uh, are trying to undermine the political class. And I don't know if they're ready, but we'll have a conversation around that, <laughs> the consulting class. And I think it's a wonderful thing because I think you're, you're right. I want to talk a little bit though about how we get there. So we talked about the example of Australia. We talked about how uh, even in Massachusetts, there's something on the books, but talk a little bit about the gateway reforms, EJ, that you mentioned. The gateway reforms that we need in order for universal voting to actually function. Can you talk a little bit about what those look like? Yeah. Um, when you ask people about this, one of the uh, big doubts that those who are against it have uh, is whether it would be fair to impose this system when there are states or parts of the process that are making it harder for people to vote. And they're right. We don't want to impose this system on top of a system of voter suppression, because requiring people to vote and then throwing up obstacles is uh, they, they cancel each other out and put the citizen in a pickle. Uh, and so a lot of the reforms that we propose are a lot of the things that were in the Freedom to Vote Act. There are a lot of the things that about half the states in our country have moved toward already everything from same day registration to easy mail voting to extensive early voting to widespread availability of drop boxes, we would like to make election day a national holiday. Um, in Australia, they always vote on Saturday when most people are off, which by the way, makes it easy for them to have very convenient polling places because every school in the country is available mm. uh, for uh, voting. Um, and so we think that the combination of the you must vote with very easy access, we'll get everybody up. My favorite picture is of voting in Australia is a picture of a voting booth with four surfers in their wetsuits with their surfboards near Bondi Beach, casting their ballots. They jumped out of the surf, went to the polling place, voted and jumped back into the surf. That gives you a sense that everybody feels uh, a stake in the system. Um, and I'm sure there are a few people who grumble. People grumble about jury duty. Uh, but for the most part, there is a real embrace of this system. And as just to go back to what you said earlier, we quote somebody in the book who told the New York Times in Australia, election day is like a party. And so we make it a, a celebration of freedom, not a dreary six hour wait in a long line, which should not happen in any precinct in America. I think that's right. I mean, I think when we start talking about the, that we can't offer people water in lines, my question is like, why are they in line? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, 100%. Yeah, that's that exactly we're, we're right. We're solve the wrong, the wrong problem there. It's not about the water. It's the fact that it's a time tax on people, as ever, so many people yeah. say. I want to, Miles, I want to turn to you because in reading the book, uh, you mentioned Cornell Brooks. Uh, and Cornell William Brooks, he's a professor at the Kennedy School, from what I understand now. He was former head of the NAACP, and he really crystallized what happened on January 6th. He says that January 6th was the fundamental effort of massive voter suppression because they were trying to invalidate the votes of 81 million Americans after a fair certified election. We won't even talk about the fact that everybody who cast a ballot in 2020 was exposing themselves in some ways to their health in order to be enfranchised with their vote because of the pandemic and the insecurity around that. Could you talk a little bit about how that is the grossest example to date of of voter suppression and why universal voting will help heal us in this way? Well, I think that, uh, you know, as I said before, you know, we've, we've been in a sort of contest between the better angels of our nature, I might, I might say, to, uh, to expand the, the franchise and make sure that we are a fully inclusive and fully participatory democracy. For some people, that's a scary thing. For some people who, particularly who thought that uh, a smaller group could control the destiny for everyone. 
uh, I think this is a worrisome time. And I think you that fear, that kind of concern, that sense of loss was stoked uh, by Donald Trump and others in order to overturn an election and enshrine uh, you know, white minority rule for the rest of the of the of the of the time. Now, what's interesting, I do want to say this as a former election official. I think there are a number of Republican elected officials and election officials who really try hard and work hard to make democracy work. That's right. They're, they're encouraging people to vote. They're encouraging the vote to be done, um, um, you know, fairly. And they're resisting pressures in some cases to uh, to do to do the wrong thing, so to speak. But, uh, you know, but unfortunately, a, a significant grouping within the Republican Party is really aiming to just enshrine minority rule by any means necessary in January 6th. And I'm, at this point in January, people understand January 6th was not, um, you know, a couple of thousand people storming the Capitol. It was part of a much larger, carefully crafted, sinister plot to overthrow the workings of the government. And uh, and that's that we can't allow. And I think if we have everyone voting, everybody participating, everybody feeling part of the process, we'll make those things less likely to happen. No, I mean, I, I remember watching it with my daughter. It should have been, a, you know, leading up to a celebratory event and having to explain to her that the reason I do the work and sometimes she doesn't see me at home is to prevent that from happening because so many uh, Americans of immigrant roots, that's what we left. That's what we fled. And so that I think was one of the hardest moments to watch uh, being the, seeing the desecration of our capital in that way. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I think we collectively do the work because we deeply believe in Americans' right to choose wisely their future and giving them agency. Um, we have another question right now from an anonymous attendee. The Republicans are currently doing everything they can to reduce the potential electorate because they think that more voting there is, there will be more, more will vote for Democrats. What is the likelihood that your idea would be instituted in such a political climate? Well, Miles, you know, or EJ, go ahead. Yeah, one of the things that, one of the points we make in the book is that it is something of a myth that increasing the electorate automatically uh, elects Democrats or elects progressives. Um, we point to the 2020 election where um, the Donald Trump's vote went up very significantly between uh, 2016 and 2020. Some of that is, of course, because everyone knew the stakes were very high. But some of that was because of all of these efforts to make it easier to vote, and that included Republicans. And if you ask yourself, how in the world did Democrats lose House seats uh, in the 2020 election? It was because there was a very significant increase in the votes of working class whites who were more uh, in favor of the Republicans now. That's a big change from my childhood down in Fall River, Massachusetts. But the Republicans have made real inroads among uh, working class white people. And so those turnout increases in those districts helped elect Republicans. So thing one we want to do is to make very clear that you know Miles and I are progressives. But we're not doing this because we think this is a free ticket for progressives to win every election. In Australia, not only was this idea originated by conservatives, but conservatives have done extremely well uh, in recent elections uh, in Australia. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is we think, although we know this will take a lot of work in terms of persuasion, um, that this system by saying everybody counts, everybody's in, uh, would actually increase confidence uh, in the system. Uh, you'd know that everybody had to vote. We are very much for putting a lot of money into good election administration, not break the bank money. It wouldn't take a lot more money uh, to run elections in a really efficient way, and that would include fighting fraud. So. We think that this idea, uh, if we could ever sort of have experiments in various places, which is our first uh, hope, is that states and municipalities will experiment with this, um, we can show that it's not trying to rig the vote, it's trying to get everybody in the system. And Miles, one of the pieces of legislature, legislation that was attempted to actually pass universal voting at the more local state level was in Connecticut. How, how did that fare? Where are we there? Well, it's interesting. It's, it's um, 
a bill was passed, was, was introduced, I should say, not passed, uh, actually by a student of EJ's, a former student of EJ's, Senator Will Haskell, uh, uh, the youngest state senator in Connecticut's history. Um, and, you know, it was in the middle of COVID and there was a real pressure on people not to, you know, put up pie, so-called pie in the sky bills. So uh, it will have to be reintroduced. But I think what, what we're trying to do, what we're hoping to do over the next, call it two years, is to one, you know, sort of get the idea out in the public debate. So we're obviously thankful to the Harvard Bookstore for making this possible tonight, <laughs> but also, uh, you know, getting people to write about it, to review it, to review the book, to think about the, uh, the topic, et cetera, in the kind of journalistic and academic circles. Secondly, I am a huge believer in the fact that there is a really robust democracy movement that is developing, Voto Latino being one key anchor of same. Um, uh, and that what we want is for people, organizations in that movement to take this up as part of their agenda, not to supplant other things that are more immediate and more needing to be done, not to supplant litigation against voter suppression, not to supplant efforts to do same day voter registration, but we'll make this a part of their agenda. And then thirdly, I think it, uh, uh, consistent with their role of laboratories of democracy, we're hoping that starting next year, uh, some states and some municipalities will take the plunge, will see this as something that they really ought to try to work on. And if we can get it passed in a few places and have it demonstrate its validity and its usefulness, then I think it can spread. And that's our hope and our goal. And I think there is a bill up in Massachusetts, by the way, the bill, the two places that we know of where it's been introduced are Will's bill in Connecticut, which is our, an appendix in our book just to show people, yes, this can be done. And second, there's a bill in Massachusetts. We hope we'll have more next year and these municipal experiments as well. No, that's helpful. I, so we do have a, qu a question from the audience, and I know that part of the universal voting, this is something we debated often, Miles and EJ, and it was the, what would happen if the fine was too excessive, or would this lead to a, you know, another uh, possibility of jailing individuals and then leading us back to a scenario of uh, the former Jim Crow laws? And the question is, and they say that this is an unfair question, but it's a legitimate question that we debated a lot during the universal task yeah. force. But is but in America, in the American climate, the excessive jailing, what would be the risk that compulsory voting would lead to more people like Pamela Moses, who was sentenced to six years in prison for trying to re register to vote? Well, actually, I think if anybody is sent to prison, it would be the people who are trying to stop her from voting because we would declare that she Can you repeat has that again? <laughs> a right and a duty to vote. I, uh, what, my, I'll let Miles talk about this. We go out of our way to make very clear this is not a criminal fine, to keep it low, to give people easy ways out of it, to allow them to pay it with an hour of community service. We absolutely do not want to create a Ferguson problem. And we were we took a lot of advice on this, as you know, Maria Teresa, uh, to prevent it from being like that. We're not looking for punishment. We're looking uh, for this culture where everybody comes to accept that, yes, this is a duty for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the uh, individual states or municipalities that adopt universal voting, if they do, will have to actually craft the kind of nitty gritty details of the legislation. But our recommendation, as EJ says, is that the fine be very small, that it not be subject. To well, you mentioned $20 specifically in your in the book. Yeah, right? no more than 20 bucks. Right, right. Um, you know, no that interest. It, that it not be subject to interest, that it not be subject to penalties, and it never be the basis for a criminal warrant. So mm -hmm. that's sort of what the, the, the scenario is. And in general, you know, and I'll make the other point, which is the, the other worry that we had and people that we've talked to is what happens if someone is not a citizen or has recently been released from prison and, is, and you know, has had their rights removed, and yet they get all the information about you have to vote, you have to vote, and so they vote, um, you know, uh, incorrectly. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the legislation would, would uh, if our recommendations are followed, would make it very clear that inadvertent voting uh, is not covered by the law and is not subject to any kind of uh, penalty. In general, the, the you know, if you impose uh, or, or if you enact universal voting on a system where people are having all kinds of barriers to voting, that's really not going to work. 
So what we want is for the kind of what we call gateway reforms to be adopted to make sure that it's easy for people to vote, to make sure that the registration system is externally facing and really getting people into the process. And then we can actually get people to vote. And practically speaking, uh, the states that might really seriously consider this will be places where they already have pretty good election laws and they already have encouraging turnout. And we think that those are the places that we'll go to first as we start thinking about really implementing this. Incidentally, we do endorse um, uh, dropping that ban on former felons from voting, which was mm -hmm. instituted initially for fundamentally racist reasons. If you pay your debt, you should get your rights back. You're here. Uh, so I we have roughly about nine minutes left. I want to open up to questions. Uh, if anybody has questions, please put it into the in the chat box uh, on the question and answer. Uh, if there are no questions coming, I am an activist by nature and by heart. So I will ask you, EJ and Miles, what can someone do right now who's listening to this conversation besides buy your book? Besides buy your book, what else can they do to help advance universal voting? Go ahead, Miles is the organizer. Miles is actually starting a campaign on this. So I think Miles right. should take that one away. And for the fact, I didn't know this. So this is terrific. It was not a leading question. Miles, tell us. What can we, are, we, do? we are actually hoping and planning that as the, you know, the, the, as the book gets more and more, you know, out there and the idea gets more and more out there that we are going to uh, kind of stand up uh, an initiative, which we hope to call the 100% Democracy Initiative. Um, you know, fully equipped with a website and where people can join in, into the fight. But what I hope will happen now is in addition to, uh, you know, looking and reading the book, for people to discuss with other people this idea, you know, the very first react, this is, it's, it's astonishing to me that having worked on voting rights issues for 35 years, I had never been in a discussion of this issue ever until I actually read E.J. Dion's paper that he wrote with, with Bill Galston for Brookings in 2015. And all of a sudden it was like a light bulb went off. And I said, well, this, here's a, we've, I've worked all this time to try to move the needle and we have moved the needle. I mean, some people are trying to yank the needle back, but we have moved the needle, <laughs> but not nearly enough. And this is a kind of game changing idea that can really move the needle from a 60% uh, participatory society to a 90% participatory society. And so it really, really appeals to me. So I'm, what, what I'm hoping is that this becomes conversation among people in organizations, among activists, uh, um, in family dinners, et cetera. And so the idea gets normalized. And so when it gets introduced as a possible piece of legislation, it has some support and it doesn't come way out of left field. That's wonderful. Uh, we do have someone from Amira and she is asking, um, as, long, as a longtime member of Common Cause, these reforms sound great. And if we could combine university, universal voting with public financing, the focus of campaigns would be on the ideas and policies, thus creating an informed electorate. However, how could we get around Citizens United? Must we have a constitutional amendment to address Citizens United? Well, I'd be for uh, the uh, constitutional amendment, but I don't think a constitutional amendment is necessary uh, to enact a uh, and uh, versions of this were in freedom to vote and in for the people uh, the for the people act, uh, where you have a system that encourages candidates to go with small dollar financing by matching uh, contributions. There's nothing in Citizens United that says. Uh, that the government could not create a, a fund. I always like the idea of taxing the PACs to do that, but we there were a lot of ways. They, 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 they had a lobbyist tax actually in the bill to pay for this, um, where your contribution of say up to $50 or up to $100 would be matched five times, seven times through this fund. So it would become realistic for candidates to run with only small dollar financing. And we've talked a lot about, and it's, there are real ones, real problems created by new technologies and uh, the lies you can spread online and all that. But the new technologies have revolutionized fundraising so that small dollar financing is much more of a reality today uh, because of how you can raise five, 10 bucks at a time uh, online. And so I think that um, you know, I, I would like a different Supreme Court that would realize that Citizens United went against 
depending on how you count 30 years or 100 years really of precedent mm -hmm. um, and turn Citizens United over, I would take a constitutional amendment, but I think we can move toward public financing. I just want to say our book does not get into these reforms. We have a chapter at the end where we talk about these ideas on, on campaign finance, on gerrymandering. Um, we don't like the electoral college, Miles and I either. Uh, we are not presenting universal civic duty voting as an elixir that cures everything that ails you. We agree with the questioner that there's a lot of reform that needs to be done, but we do believe that this idea could give us a big push in the right direction on another front. And Maria Teresa, I was glad you raised the point that if people don't have to worry about turnout or voter protection uh, at the polls of people who'd be pushed away, uh, you cut an awful lot of expenditure out of campaigns. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, and something, you know, I read actually what you just mentioned, I think folks don't really don't realize, but and I read a, a piece on this uh, a couple of years ago, that when we look at what has really broken down silos and actually created democracy is the financing of small dollar donors. And it's actually broken away the power of party and local party has less control of the young candidates that run as a result. But if we did the same thing with universal voting, those good dollars could go back into into basically asking people, do you like my ideas or not? And these are the ideas I have to serve you, which I think we would get into a better place. Um, we're coming up to the end of the conversation. Gentlemen, is, does anybody have another question before we start closing out? If not, um, it looks like Claire's about to pop on, but I do, you know, I want, what are your closing thoughts, uh, Miles and EJ? Well, I would say this, I, I would say that this has given me, and I'm very appreciative of the response that we've been getting so far. You know, it hasn't been, what are you people crazy? Are you pie in the sky dreamers? Well, sort of, but- But uh, that's America, we were built on a dream, right? So we're <laughs> right. But the truth is, I think that this is a brand new idea that I think has the possibility to resonate and to make a really, really good discussion. So I'm thankful to the working group and Maria Teresa to you as part of as a key part of it. Uh, I'm delighted to be working with EJ on this. And I think that this is something that we're our intention is to just keep moving forward and try to make this into a hopeful uh, 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 look for the future. And I'll say one last thing, which is one phrase that EJ uses sometimes that I really, really like is that this book and this idea are unapologetically and determinedly uh, and faithful and having faith in our democracy. That's the kind of, that's the kind of dreamer I want to be. And I just want to close one of my favorite lines, which uh, Winston Churchill is supposed to have said, uh, is that Americans always do the right thing after first exhausting all of the other possibilities. And I love that line because I think that one of the greatest things about our country is our capacity for self-correction. Uh, and if you look at voting, the progress we've made since the beginning of our republic is extraordinary. We started out as a country where only white men with property could vote. Uh, and then we extended the franchise to all white men. And then briefly after the Civil War, we extended it to black Americans. That was pushed back uh, in acts of violence that are too similar in some ways to some of the things we're seeing uh, today. Then we'll, finally we gave the vote to women and with the Voting Rights Act, we, re we uh, extended the franchise to all Americans. So we have made taken many steps forward. We think that this system that we propose could take us the rest of the way. We've been working toward 100% uh, democracy throughout our history. We think we can finish the job. We want people to stop having to ask, why are they suppressing voters? We want people to say, why not? Why not try an idea that works that will make us more fully democratic and that could turn election day into a great big party. 
<laughs> I like the idea of a big, great party. Though a footnote, we weren't fully enfranchised as a country until 1974, when Latinos and non-English native speakers were actually allowed to cast a ballot. So that included a whole bunch of indigenous communities who did not- Oh, you're right. There was, in fact, we've got that in the book. There so is that. that. Um, but I always highlight it because we don't realize how new to the system so many of us still are. But with that, I want to say if people- if people don't realize the fire and opportunity that we have before us, I hope that this conversation has enlightened you. I love the book, not only because it is really practical, but because it is solutions oriented. In a time when people kind of wring their hands and they say, we don't know what to do now, read 100% Democracy because we actually know what to do. And it's all about living limitlessly, thinking big, being audacious, and not only fixing our democracy, but preparing it for the 21st century of those future voters. Thank you so much, Miles. Thank you so much, EJ. Thank you so much, Claire. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again to Maria Teresa, Miles, and EJ uh, for a great conversation, particularly for your warm words about the bookstore. Um, and thank you to everyone out there for spending your evening with us. Uh, you can learn more about and purchase 100% Democracy at harvard.com or via the link in the chat that I put in there. Um, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading, register to vote, um, and please be well. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.